government of India. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together to welcome our special guest, Mr. Sanjay Varma. Also inviting our distinguished moderator, Dr. Vidya Yeradekar, Chair Fiki Higher Education Committee, and the Poor Chancellor, Symbiosis International University. Inviting our eminent panelist, Mr. Darpan Jain, Joint Secretary, Department of Commerce, Ministry of Commerce and Industry, Government of India. Let's welcome him. Inviting Mr. Pavan Agarwal, former Secretary, Government of India. Warm welcome to you, sir. Inviting Dr. Prem Singh, Advisor Education, Niti Aayog. A very warm welcome to you, sir. Inviting Mr. Manoj Kumar, Chairman and Managing Director, Ed CIO. A very warm welcome, sir. Inviting Professor Dr. Sanjeev Chaturvedi, Advisor at India, Uzbekistan, Entrepreneurship Development. A warm welcome to you, sir. Also inviting Dr. Abhay Sena, Director General, SEPC. And of course, we have on the stage with us our distinguished moderator, Dr. Vidya Yeradekar, Chair Fiki, Higher Education Committee, and Pro Chancellor, Symbiosis International University. And our special guest, Mr. Sanjay Varma, Secretary West. Ministry of External Affairs, Government of India. And ladies and gentlemen, the topic for this panel discussion session is developing India as the global higher education hub and the time duration for this session is approximately about 1 hour 30 minutes. But before we begin with the proceedings of this session, I would request Dr. Vidya Yaradekar to kindly do the honours of welcoming and honouring our special guest, Mr. Sanjay Verma with a green certificate. Ladies and gentlemen, the Green Certificate is an initiative of FIKI where a thicket of 10 trees is planted in the Sundarbans National Park, West Bengal in the name of the Secretary, Mr. Sanjay Varma. Thank you very much indeed, sir, and a very warm welcome to you. And I would now hand over to our distinguished moderator, Dr. Vidya Yavdekar. A warm welcome to you, ma'am, and over to you to kindly carry forward the proceedings of the session. Thank you very much. A very good afternoon to all of you all. This is a post-lunch session, but nevertheless, we are going to make it very, very interesting. Uh, the session, of course, has already been mentioned, is developing India as a global higher education hub. And I think we have the best of panelists here. This session will be in two parts. One, of course, as a special address by uh, Mr. Sanjay Verma, Secretary West, uh, Ministry of External Affairs, Government of India. Attracting foreign students to conventional programs, but uh, attracting foreign students to even through our online degree programs that many of our category one institutions have started offering and apart from this the UGC has come up with a wonderful dual degree and joint degree notification that helps us to invite more and more students uh, for dual degrees and uh, I think there's something else going on parallelly uh, so, uh, inviting more and more students uh, for these dual and joint degree programs. And apart from this, uh, you know, we've never ever looked at the students from developed countries and what can we do to invite them to India. So, there are various things that we will discuss in this panel. But before that, uh, let me invite uh, the Secretary West, Mr. Sanjay Varmaji, uh, to give his thoughts because he holds a very important portfolio uh, and a portfolio from where the largest number of foreign students actually come and study with us. Uh, so we will be happy to uh, listen to you. Thank you. Thank you Vidya ji, uh, my co-panelists, uh, distinguished uh, guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, namaskar, a very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, thank you for the privilege to uh, address the 17th FIKI Higher Education Summit. Uh, now these these uh, my my remarks are actually something I put together based on my experiences uh, both as a student in Mumbai and in Delhi in JNU and my assignments in Africa uh, in Addis Ababa and Dubai and uh, China and several other places. So I'll try and give you a sense of uh, I'll try and uh, move away from the script. Uh, and uh, try and sort of give you a texture of what I think uh, the issues uh, are uh, on this subject. I'm glad, Vidya ji, uh, I, I don't think you meant it as a slip, but you said uh, developing India as a global higher education hub, not as the 
uh, global higher education hub. That, that of course, is the ultimate dream. Uh, but I think let's begin by looking at India as a, as a hub because we still have a long, long way to go. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me begin by saying that uh, the subject of uh, the summit or of this particular session is extremely relevant, uh, very topical, and uh, this is relevant for India as we embark on the next stage of our socio-economic development. It is relevant to the world as it structures a post-pandemic 21st century ready economic and development pathway that is underpinned by knowledge. Reimagining education, especially higher education, is central to such endeavors. The vision of the national education policy, I'm sure the national education policy must have come up several times during the conference and will, I think, in the uh, subsequent uh, sessions as well. Uh, from where I stand, I think uh, uh, the policy intends to make our education system uh, truly global, develop knowledge, skills, values, and dispositions that support responsible commitment to human rights, sustainable development and living, and global well-being, thereby reflecting a truly global citizen. Uh, to achieve this, India is reaching out to other nations to establish focus and effective partnerships. I'm sure this endeavor will help Indian students, universities and institutions scale new heights. Uh, friends, you can't reimagine any education system without a sense of appreciating change and anticipating tomorrow. It is said that this is an era to learn, unlearn, and relearn. It is a time to revisit the proverbial learning curve. We are in an unprecedented time of disruption. There is no aspect of our existence that could rely on a playbook of yesterday. In any case, any playbook, playbook today has a very short shelf life. Uh, if you look at polity, uh, the way political institution, international affairs, geopolitics politics is changing, economics, I think macroeconomic theories are under review. Behavioral economics has supplanted the uh, the satirist paribus assumptions of economics. Uh, the new economic, new monetary uh, theory is again challenging uh, the assumptions on inflation, etc. In society, sociology, I think the young generation uh, with their fresh outlook, approach, attitudes, and aspirations defy uh, modeling in terms of uh, uh, anticipation of where, uh, what uh, the new generation will want. We, we should hear about millennials, then we hear, heard about general Z, uh, Gen Z, and now Gen Alpha, etc. And this, the mindset of the young is very different. Now we need to anticipate uh, all that. I'm not even going into the environmental change, etc. That is another disruption of its time. It is said that a rising tide lifts all boats. For our higher education system to be attractive to foreigners, the easiest route is that the overall standard of higher education in India must improve and be relevant to our times. There will be several questions which will need to be confronted and how do we go about doing this. What will be the medium of instruction in our higher education institutions for foreign nationals? What should be the target country? Global South, to begin with. There is a certain Malthusian relate, related uh, faculty student ratio issue in our country. Overcrowded classrooms and no, no advertisements to attract foreign students. How do we get our universities to game the global ranking surveys or even to get them to participate? How do we get our institutions of higher learning to step up their academic output, research papers, IPR, patent registrations, in short, get more of the intellectual capital into the public space. A leaf can be taken out here from the dramatic improvement in the performances of our Indian think tanks in global rankings. Now, in my personal view, the way Indian think tanks have captured the imagination of the global world, uh, the, our university system has lagged behind. Uh, let me give you an instance. Observer Research Foundation is ranked number six in the world. Chatham House, which you, you have heard is a well-known and much older think tank, is ranked 22nd on that list. So you can, I'm just giving you a sense of, and for ORF to become in the top three or four in the next few years is, is, is probably a very, very strong likelihood. Uh, now you contrast this with our academic output, how many professors write for newspapers or come on television stations or have a podcast which has a large following. I think there's a big gap. But if you look at a 
other think tanks, look at the podcast, the output, etc. On the variety of subjects they put out, papers, high quality, high quality. The other positive thing is, I remember as a student in Mumbai or even JNU, when you looked or you scanned through newspapers, magazines for Indian uh, uh, content, uh, it it wasn't inspiring. It uh, it wasn't prolific, and you found that there was a big gap between what you uh, were exposed to in India and what the quality of writing uh, available from overseas sources. This was then. Today, when I listen to podcasts, I'm impressed by the quality of Indian podcasts. I'm impressed by the writings in Indian mainstream uh, media or in the op-ed columns or the long pieces uh, or the books written. I mean, the, it's not surprising today to see the Financial Times summer reading list and find a handful, more than a handful of Indian writers writing on psychology or Indian origin, Indian writers on psychology, on economics, on, on foreign affairs, on, on cuisine on culture, Bollywood, we are, being, we are catching the imagination and I think the think tanks have got it right and individuals have got it right but I, I personally do believe that the universities need to be there more out there so that they act like, uh, like advertisements not just for foreign students but your own students within the country. How do we get a cross pollination between academia and industry or the real world? Innovation, incubation, R&D and entrepreneurship need to be seen as establishing a synergy with our institution of higher learning as their fountainheads. Interdisciplinary syllabi will need to become the norm. How do we increase scholarships to attract foreign students? Can the plethora of MOUs between our academic institutions and foreign universities be replaced by meaningful and functional agreements? Uh, wherever I've gone in different parts of the world, uh, there's a rush to sign MOUs. Uh, and most of these MOUs are never followed through. There is no effective engagement. These are just some things people do to put on their record that, you know, my university has 120 MOUs all over the world, different continents, etc. But what is the bottom line? How much are you engaging? How much are you exchanging? Are you exchanging faculty? Are you exchanging students? Are you ex exchanging information, syllabi? What have you? It's, it's, it's a very poor record. Uh, I'm just giving you this example because this is an energy not well spent. Can joint dual degrees twinning be a half, half a house for our educational institutions to internationalize? How do you incentivize talent for teaching? What about a legacy of rote learning versus the demand for creative and innovative thinking, problem solving abilities of our time? My own theory was when we were studying, I mean we all gone through the rote, rote process. I did SSC and HSC in Mumbai and a BA and then JNU. JNU was of course slightly different in that it wasn't all rote learning. Uh, it was a little ahead of its time in the way it taught and I'm talking about the late 80s. But yes, rote learning is what defines largely, I mean, I remember mugging up mathematics to pass. So I mean, I mean, you can take the rote learning thing to a different level altogether. But, but the advantage India has over certain other countries where rote learning is, is the norm is that while you're in college or you're in school, you are in a, a confined, uh, a, a defined environment where probably free thinking is not exchanged. But once you leave school, after school hours, after college hours, our society is free. So the mind, if you are interested as a student, uh, you know, you can engage, you can engage with people, express your ideas, information is available. So a student so inclined will have a flexible mind of his or her own. India allows you, but that wasn't uh, something which, uh, which is encouraged from the school or college level, but this is a, this is a reality. So the debate on rote learning, but a society which actually does encourage views and ideas to be exchanged. Okay. Uh, our standards of spending about two decades in educational institution was set a century ago, or maybe some would argue at the time of the uh, second industrial revolution or so, when the average lifespan of individuals was less than 60. So you, somebody lived up to 60 and you said they'll go to university and study till they're 20, 22, etc. Today, average age, the global average is probably 70, 75 in certain countries, is 80, 85. India, of course, we are, we are approaching 74, 75. But we are still following a system 
despite the changes challenging us that you will only think of education, formal education till the age of 20, 21, what about after that? But life today teaches you uh, innovating, learning, learning on the job, short courses, etc. So that whole mindset will have to be accepted when you're looking at foreign students. Do you only get them uh, for long uh, degree courses or you get them for short diploma? I'll talk about that a bit later in, 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 my, in my talk. There's not much left, so don't think I'm going to talk too much. Uh, the other big question is what will foreign students be interested in? In a brick and mortar uh, university or college or learning remotely, uh, edutech, uh, I mean edutech also allows you, you don't need to attract Indian students. You can reach Indian students staying back home. That is a model you can't discount that because I think I'm sure several of our own students take courses uh, from overseas whether it's uh, uh, short training courses or art appreciation or or understanding some funda of economics, etc. Uh, but all is not gloomy. I mean, if my sense of uh, uh, this uh, talk is uh, that uh, there's a lot to be done, there are some positives which we begin with. For example, we already have some uh, very strong performers, uh, individual institutions which are more than world class. I shan't name them, but there are. Uh, not, uh, not too difficult to find. What, these are what you'd call islands of excellence in the public space, but increasingly in the private space. Our IT space and medical sectors already globally recognized so that would have uh, uh, multiplier effects and uh, downstream upstream connections with academic institutions or India educated or at least uh, individuals who have done their first degrees in India uh, turn out to be world-class CEOs uh, uh, doctors e economists uh, entertainers uh, uh, writers communicators these are our brand ambassadors uh, because the question is uh, or we would always like to project you, you know this uh, the the Google or the Microsoft uh, Microsoft CEO his first uh, degree was in India and b both of these personalities graduated from private engineering colleges uh, college in India so it's not always about IITs so this this th these things are the positives going ahead Ministry of External Affairs and uh, making India a higher education global hub uh, we are uniquely placed because we not only see incoming foreign students but we also see outgoing Indian students. Sometimes most of our energy is spent on, on overseeing uh, uh, for Indian students studying uh, abroad. I was in Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan two days ago. There are 15,000 Indian students studying medicine there. Uh, in Ukraine there were 22,000. Uh, Russia has probably more. Croatia has foreign Indian foreign students. Uh, Bangladesh has uh, Indian medical students. Nepal has. So, I mean, these numbers are large. Managing those students looking after their welfare sorting out their peer trouble or ensuring to the extent uh, for Indian embassy can or the standards being maintained so that they can clear their uh, their medical entrance uh, the CMI exam the CMC as is what what's called so that that occupies our attention uh, Vidya ji mentioned the embassies are probably not doing enough uh, to publicize uh, Indian educational institutions to foreign st foreign students which may have a point I'm not totally denying that uh, uh, her, her, her observation is of the mark. So I suggested uh, let's look at the model followed in commerce, trade and investments. We work very closely with our colleagues from the Ministry of Commerce and Industry here but when it comes to operational issues and when we have a query of, on where to invest or where to source products from or services, uh, we turn to some standard uh, standalone uh, institutions. Uh, I can easily readily think of Invest India. Now that is a PPP partnership model and uh, we introduce uh, the query to them, follow it up to a certain extent and then Invest India takes that query forward identifies uh, uh, suppliers in India or buyers or provides information to make that FDI transaction smooth. So similarly whether it's a, a, a tech at Etsil. Etsil or any other such organization in India which can put up uh, a vertical which is uh, which is user friendly, uh, is multilingual, is uh, refreshed at least 20 times a day. You have to look at the Invest India website. It's, it's refreshed almost every hour or so in terms of the data it's, it sort of uh, puts out about India. So Etsil or any other similar institution can put together information about Indian educational institutions 
executions in real time with the relevant FAQs, uh, images, uh, uh, and, and that can be shared by, with foreign foreign students. Uh, MEA through ICCR. Uh, extends about 4,000 scholarships to foreign students. These are largely from the neighborhood and Africa. Uh, uh, it's a successful program. Uh, from the outside, maybe it doesn't appear that successful because it's only, apparently was only uh, extended to public universities. But I shared my experience uh, that uh, they have, uh, in, a, in a very small manner, ICCR is also now extending that to private universities. So a foreign student can take uh, uh, admissions in a foreign university fully sponsored by ICCR. Uh, the other vertical uh, which is a very interesting one which MEA does is called the ITEC program. It is the Indian Technology Economic Cooperation program. Uh, about 12 to 13,000 such scholarships. These are short term uh, programs for about from two weeks to probably a month or six weeks at best and they range, these short courses and they can range from, on, on, from solar energy or space uh, to soil conservation, English language, auditing, uh, name it and you know it's, it's mind-boggling. Uh, some of the finest uh, institutions in India are, are, uh, are authorized uh, to conduct. This is also includes several private uh, institutes. So this is a very neat arrangement. You get a foreign national, you fly him in at your expense, you uh, house him usually in a three to four uh, star hotel, uh, in, uh, you know with, uh, with full local hospitality and good quality inputs in short technical courses in, in English language naturally because that becomes the easy way out and this is very successful. It's lesser known so when you look at foreign students I don't think you always need to look at long term heavy anchor uh, dropping foreign students even and that may be the future ahead. Uh, so ITEC is, a, is, is, is something some of you may want to examine closely on, on how successful it is. Our learning is that to attract foreign students in our higher educational institutions, we'll need to upgrade our infrastructure. Hostels, uh, the sanitation in hostels, the quality of furniture, mattress, uh, the toilets, uh, the food. Uh, in my my opinion is that food is Indian food is actually our greatest biggest cultural asset but the way we handle it with respect to foreigners we make it a liability sometimes it's only the diehard endophile who will you know jump into a regular hot curry or uh, you know not think twice about uh, uh, hygiene etc so things like belly belly you know upset tummy uh, high on and I'm, sim I'm simply mentioning this because these are basics uh, people forget I mean for a foreigner who's only had bland food all his life he comes in one the traffic hits him I mean it, it takes days for him to recover from the I mean we are so used to our traffic but it is right yes it's like a bloody revolution on the streets the honking the counter traffic uh, pedestrians so that that is a shock the student goes in the food is a shock uh, either it's too too spicy or not hygienically cooked so he's grappling with understanding the accent he can't figure out the traffic the food is you know may, make him sick the hostel room is not up to the mark and if you're a lady you're worried about security issues etc so you're not going anywhere would you want to come back would you want to stay uh, Continuing that, uh, medium of instruction, uh, dialects or heavy accents can be an issue. A single window admission process would be useful. Congenial atmosphere for students to study is non-negotiable. Safety security is also important. Work opportunities after studying in India will become a consideration for foreign students. Alumni engagement should be a strength, but like food is currently a weakness. It's a weakness within the government system too. We would have uh, given scholarship to maybe quarter million people since independence, maybe more, maybe less. Uh, but our ability to handle the alumni database uh, was an issue. We're working on it. Uh, I think ICCR has started an Indian alumni portal for all, private and public this year. So all institutions need to work on that because the time, energy you've invested in that foreign student in your country is lost once he or she leaves. Of course, there are some individuals who will continue their connection with your country but if the 
college does it, the university does it, and makes that person feel special even after he or she is left it, I think the dividends are, are untold. And then you can keep pushing uh, information about India, uh, investment opportunities or opportunities with regard to your institution as well. To conclude, so from the perspective of making India a global hub for education, the scenario currently is like, let me give you an example from Bollywood. Um, Sometimes you remember some great songs from Bollywood films, uh, wonderful lyrics, music, uh, composition, arrangement, etc. But you won't remember the movie because the, the, you know the, the, the concept of islands of excellence. So currently in India, our institutes are like islands of excellence. We have to make the whole film worthy of viewing, not just the forms. Make the film uh, memorable so that people remember the songs, remember the film, remember India and the totality. And why shouldn't they remember India? Because we are today one of the world's fastest growing major economies. We are an economic opportunity. We need foreign talent to sort of uh, to give the thinking process a churn in India. Also, if you're a student of humanities, I think uh, the sociological uh, lab which India provides or the political uh, or, or the social psychological, the you know how society is changing, the drastic. Um, I mean, there's a wonderful book I was reading, Shayana Bhattacharya on desperately seeking Shah Rukh Khan and a fascinating book now again about talking about how creative Indians are she is an economist she has used the life story of women from different uh, socio-economic uh, backgrounds, uh, rural, urban, etc. She's tracked those uh, girls on how they've moved up in life. And uh, it's fascinating the way she, she chooses these uh, stories. And uh, these girls are not inspired by Gandhiji or Vivekananda or quotations from Bible, Quran or uh, Vincent Peale or whoever the, you know, motivational speaker. They are all inspired by Shah Rukh Khan. Now, now, this is a wonderful concept and the only reason I'm talking about it is because this shows how creative Indians are getting, uh, books are getting better. So, read this book. Fascinating, Shah Rukh Khan, dialogues are taken from films and how in the era of toxic masculinity, uh, Shah Rukh Khan appears as a reason of hope for women across the socio-economic uh, class barriers, etc. And that is about changing India. And the point I'm making is is that India is changing so much, there's so much to study and absorb and analyze and do your PhDs on. I mean, behavioral economics could probably uh, have a field day in our country. I shall conclude here, I think I've spoken too much, but uh, this is uh, my experiences uh, from, from different parts of the world. Africans love us, they would want to come here. Uh, sometimes they do feel uh, uh, victims of uh, racism, uh, but uh, depending on the country, I think the quality of students, uh, Ethiopia for sure, I think uh, the students were very earnest. Uh, Gulf, the focus is largely on our diaspora children because in Gulf the local populace is usually 10 to 15 percent of the total population except Saudi Arabia. In UAE, I think the Emirati is only 14 percent of the total population. So anything you're doing in the Gulf, you're largely doing for your own diaspora. I should conclude here. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, it's wonderful talking to you, Vidya Ji. Thank you very much. So uh, thank you very much, sir. I, uh, he is in a hurry to leave, but I'm very happy that uh, he could find time to come and address us in, in spite of his very hectic and busy schedule. So there is a lot that you have said, and there's a lot that we can take from what you have said, and certainly we'll incorporate. Uh, you know, your I hope you can pass on the copy of your speech to us so that we can incorporate it in our notes uh, that we are, we will be giving to the ministry. So we move on to our uh, 
panel discussion. Uh, as I said earlier, we have an excellent panel here. Uh, people who have been policy makers, uh, have been policy makers, I purposely say this. Uh, people who are as policy makers and uh, others who are actually service providers or making policies for services and uh, championing education as one of the champion services. So I'm so very happy that we have a wonderful panel here. Uh, I will first request Mr. Pavan Agarwal, who I always say that his heart is in education, though he's moved on into several uh, ministries, uh, right from food to other ministries. But uh, I still remember the book that he wrote on internationalization of higher education, and I do cite it in many of my research papers. And he will, uh, I would request Pavanji to lay a foundation uh, for, you know, for this uh, discourse that is going to happen, because uh, se on several occasions, personally as well as uh, institutionally we've discussed with him uh, about this very topic of how india can uh, be created as a uh, as an education hub at least in this part of asia so over to you thank you thank you uh, vidya uh, good afternoon friends uh, uh, Dr. Vidya mentioned people who have been policy makers. I have been policy maker, okay. So I'm in that category, okay. So I, you know, this is uh, in many ways homecoming for me. You know, I have spent quarter of a century in higher education policy making space, uh, right from 1998 onwards. Uh, first with the Ministry of uh, HRDA, which became Ministry of Education now. Uh, subsequently with the University Grants Commission, later with Planning Commission as advisor, higher education. And then, if that was not enough, you know, I also spent a couple of years researching on higher education uh, policy. Uh, I think Dr. Vidya mentioned about uh, book. I've written books and uh, perhaps I think uh, though it may not look <laughs> uh, humble to say that uh, perhaps uh, I must be somebody who has written most on Indian higher education or higher education in comparative perspective with uh, other Asian countries, with Latin American countries, etc. Uh, as a part of my Fulbright program uh, on higher education globally. So uh, then I left the higher education space uh, in late 2014. So from that time onwards, I had opportunity of looking at developments in higher education from outside. Uh, and as Dr. Vidya mentioned that my heart continues to be there, so I looked at it. Also in these 25 years, you know, I have two children. You know, my daughter was class 10, was 10 year old. She graduated and went into the labor market. I'm mentioning it because as experience, uh, I had experience as a parent to see how Indian higher education is doing. Now my son is, uh, uh, you know, is in a higher education institution. Both of them in some of the premier higher education institutions. So not only from a policy making space, but also as a parent and also as an observer of higher education. I would like to uh, state a few things that uh, uh, it is a very broad brush of uh, 25 years of higher education in some sense uh, and I can say with uh, a lot of uh, happiness that many things, many positive things have happened in overall higher education. I would just uh, mention five of those things. Uh, 25 years ago, I think the country was not as comfortable with private higher education as it is today. Uh, and private higher education, they were, of course, there were institutions like Symbiosis University and Mahe, uh, who were there for decades even before that, and they were very prestigious even at that point in time. But uh, that space was crowded by a large number of fly-by-night operators. Today, I think uh, private higher education in India has matured. You can find a very large number of private higher education institutions which are doing really very, very well. You know, in fact, uh, you will not see any press release from NEC when they release rankings of universities. You will find that 
a very large number of them, I think more than the public universities, uh, universities that get A++ or A+, uh, they will be private universities. You know, one can take it with a little pinch of salt and having worked and currently I am working with two public universities as chairing their committees on different aspects, I can see that uh, public higher education has serious challenges. So I think private higher education is filling the space for quality as well apart from numbers and that is a very good development and that has implication for higher education internationalization of higher education. Second is government institutions. I still remember when we wrote the 12th five year plan, we were told ki bhai new institutions nahi suggest karna hai. And that was in the year 2013-14. So uh, uh, 12th five year plan did not talk about new institutions. Then the government changed, the whole policy changed. Now in terms of number of flagship institutions that you have, and initially there were a fear that are we diluting the brand of IITs and IIMs and many people wrote about it. But I think uh, 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 that is not really very, very true. Even with the IITs, now there is a old IITs and new IITs. Many of the new IITs are becoming better than the old IITs. So things are catching up, you know. And there are hundreds of public institutions which are also truly world class uh, and I can say it uh, with some confidence as a parent that uh, the two institutions where my children went they are really world class because I have been to institutions abroad during my Fulbright years both in Europe and uh, US uh, and I think many of our institutions are really doing very very well so that is the second development third is on teaching and learning I think which is a weak point, research obviously is a weak point, I will not even cover that, which continues to be a weak point uh, in India. But on teaching and learning, we did not have good practices on teaching and learning in our institutions. And that has been one of the big challenges of India's higher education system, because uh, of a very simple reason that uh, our, you know, main higher education system is based on the affiliating college model system of uh, higher education are first universities uh, the presidency universities were established on the pattern of University of London with large number of affiliated colleges. So it was more examination oriented and as a result of this, uh, you know, uh, that teaching learning which is required for new ways learning is not something that our institutions were very comfortable with. But over the years, I think a very large number of faculty from US and some of the other European nations other than UK and UK has also changed quite significantly. You know they have brought in significant changes in the way teaching learning happens in our university system. So our teaching programs today are as good as anywhere in the world and of course uh, universities like Flame University, like Ashoka University or uh, you name some of these liberal arts universities that have come up in recent years and perhaps Symbiosis universities, they are taking those practices which are best in the world to Indian show. So that is another very positive development about India. Rankings and research competitiveness, I think we have not really done very significant amount of work except that there are much more centers of excellence on research today in India than before. But what has happened is that uh, discomfort that was there about engaging with rankings, global rankings, that has gone away. And I still remember when I was in the planning commission and when we started engaging with uh, QS uh, and Times Higher Education and Shanghai ranking, you know, there was a lot of discomfort uh, generally amongst the universities, including the IITs, that why should we engage with them? Some of that, you know, discomfort continues to be there with some institutions, but by and large there is greater acceptability of the rankings in the Indian higher education system today. The fifth is on internationalization. A few things have changed and a few things have not changed. So let me cover what has changed. <laughs> okay. uh, a few days ago, I was uh, in a conference organized by Association of Indian Universities and they have prepared a beautiful 
concept uh, background note for the conference on internationalization i will just mention about five of those developments that have taken place which are very heartening for and i'm looking at it in a time horizon of 25 years or 15 20 years you know first is i think as many as 180 universities have office for international affairs i don't remember that we had more than 10 15 universities a uh, decade or so ago who had international offices the guidelines have been issued by ugc for setting up uh, these offices of international affairs so which is a very positive development uh, second is about uh, you know uh, academic collaboration training joint programs a lot of those guidelines etc ugc has put in place which is again a very very welcome development uh, uh, you know uh, from that point of view uh, the third is is about universities institutions of eminence they've been allowed to establish campuses abroad i still remember a decade ago or a decade and a half ago when iits started thinking of establishing campuses abroad i think they are again thinking of establishing campuses abroad uh, but whether or not it will happen well, the policy is very clear that they can also establish campuses abroad and many of our private universities not only have one campus they have multiple campuses abroad i think the footprint of indian universities the indian private universities uh, in some cases is worldwide which is unique as far as internationalization and campus abroad is concerned <coughs> uh, uh, similarly the gift city which is a very interesting development and i remember when we were you know drafting those guidelines for establishing uh, you know uh, foreign institutions in india and whether you know the indian regulations will apply to them or not this was a big issue for decades i think a first step has been taken and darpan is <laughs> smiling at it i think gift city campus is established there outside the purview of indian regulatory framework so these are very very positive developments i would say uh, as far as internationalization of higher education is concerned uh, which are which i can feel very happy about now what next what has not changed is the conversations around internationalization i think my own limited experience of conversations have changed or not changed is very limited to uh, about an hour discussion before this event and about two hours event uh, two hours discussion when i was at the aiu conference and i think uh, i'm somewhat dismayed that our conversations on what needs to be done had not really changed very much the ministry of commerce thinks that bahut hamare students bahar ja rahe hain what is it that we can do to get more students to indian shows a uh, university will feel that what is it that i can do to attract more students so much of the discussion on uh, uh, you know internationalization continues to be around student mobility unfortunately you know much of the student mobility today you know it falls in three categories the pull factor the american universities attracting students from all over the world including india in large numbers the push factor because some of the indian students going to ukraine because we do not have adequate number of seats in our medical colleges the third which is becoming more than anything else is pushed by the agents the education agents and that is where the trouble is somebody was mentioning that uh, somebody will land up in chandigarh or pune and they don't know which college to go in because somebody has recruited them with some uh, giving them some dreams and they land up in pune and they see that there is nothing in the institution for which they have been admitted so it is driven by agents and i think uh, these education agents are across the world i think they dominate in terms of uh, student mobility global student mobility we need to quickly have 
some system in place that our students are not duped or foreign students are not duped when they come to India uh, by these kind of operators. Some kind of, you know, it's not an easy task. It's a very difficult task, but I think this is something that needs to be attended to on priority basis because the country is very large. We are going to be the most populated country in the world soon and will therefore have the largest number of students and largest size of higher education system as we move forward. So this is something that has not changed. That higher education, if you look at, uh, and I'm going back to my research days, uh, much of literature on internationalization is not focused on student mobility. Student mobility is an important part. I think a uh, large part of internationalization is driven by knowledge diplomacy and long-term impact of uh, internationalization of students on economies and societies. And we need to look at internationalization in that context. India is the last country, you know, we need not worry about uh, that by having a more liberal internationalization policy, but allowing foreign students to work for a few months or a couple of years in India will basically shrink Indian employment market for Indian graduates. But we should look at it from a very broad brush point of view that if there are foreign people, students coming into our campuses, some of our best campuses, they develop networks that has long term impact in terms of bringing you know commerce and cultural uh, benefits to India in a long term and that is what is happening around the world and there are a lot of literature around it how these mobility should be seen in terms of uh, uh, purely short term commercial gains now I think uh, over the last 25 years, and I would particularly say in the last 80 years, India has become a significant global player, not only in the area of uh, trade and commerce, our friends have done well even in exports, <laughs> overall exports, but uh, in, I think uh, India and Indian government is taken quite seriously in the global fora. So there is a, a time is now to see how we can benefit from newfound visibility and presence of India in global scenario and build an Indian higher education abroad. Uh, how do we build that brand? When you talk about branding, U.S. higher education is known for Fulbright fellowships. Europe, European higher education is known for the Erasmus fellowships. There, they are not attracting students for the purpose of getting money from those students. They are attracting best and the brightest from all over the world to provide life and intellectual capital to their campuses. Even if it means that governments are spending a little bit of money on that. I think that has helped those institutions and those countries to build a very high reputation for their institutions at home. If it were not for this, you know, maybe we would not have known about Cambridge University. We would not have known about Harvard University. People who have done so well in India, even during the freedom struggle, they went on scholarships to many of these countries and came back and took leadership positions in India. I think that is the kind of, uh, you know, approach we need to take towards internationalization of higher education. I would say that uh, uh, when India is taking, has taken over the presidency of the G20, is an opportune time to do something big around uh, building a brand for India higher, Indian higher education abroad. Possibly a fellowship. Uh, a flagship fellowship on the pattern of the Fulbright program or Erasmus program. Over last 75 years, there are 400,000 Fulbrighters across the world. I think in the next 25 years, if we can aim to have maybe an equivalent number of 
whatever flagship you know for the pub you know we were thinking about the name of such flagship fellowship program as a uh, you know uh, what was that uh, vishva vidya fellowship or whatever name it can be okay so as uh, such a fellowship program then it will give over a long term a huge brand to indian higher education so this is an opportunity for india to seize to look at the building india as a good education brand that will have long term benefits so the other things obviously are important uh, mr sanjay verma mentioned lot of stuff in his talk and uh, there's lot of work that is required to be done in very very serious but building a strong brand for with a flagship fellowship program is perhaps an idea whose time has come and uh, uh, i will I, and finally i think uh, uh, you know summing up the points around which i was mentioning about internationalization i think we need to have a more comprehensive holistic policy for internationalization of higher education various pieces of the puzzle are already there and all these need to be put together in the form of a comprehensive holistic narrative so that people can look up to that document that this is uh, a, a holistic policy for internationalization of higher education it should go beyond immediate commerce darpan may not like it but i think in the long term interest when he becomes the secretary government of india maybe at that time he'll say that this was the right decision to take uh, so uh, so let us look at uh, many of these things uh, particularly from medium to long term perspective rather than immediate perspective thank you very much for giving me this opportunity and i'm so happy to see this higher education summit you know maturing i still remember those early days uh, when we started it and i was associated with it for la- for 10 years uh, to begin with and last 6 7 years i've not been part of this summit thank you vidya for getting me here again and as uh, you said when i entered that it is for me like homecoming thank you thank you uh, thank you very much sir and uh, as always the first speaker gets a lot of time but the others i will have to restrict the time because he had to lay the foundation and he laid it so well uh, you know a whole canvas of what higher education is all about the five points and then of course stressing on internationalization of higher education but when we move on to uh, the the hardcore topic of how we can uh, create our country as an education hub you know there has it's not just ministry of education but other ministries that also come into play and here we have uh, Mr. Darpan Jain from the Ministry of Commerce. They've always been supporting us uh, in all our ventures, especially what we do at FICI. In fact, this very conference has been supported by them, and we see a large number of foreign delegations that come here. And we believe that these are the same delegates who will go back as our unofficial brand ambassadors. So, over to you, Mr. Jain. Thank you so much, uh, Vidya ji, and. Uh, good afternoon to everyone so i'll not take much time uh, pavan sir has already covered everything the entire evolution of uh, higher education and also the approach towards internationalization of higher education so we are all benefited by that foundation and i'll keep it very very brief i'll keep it very very transactional as sir has suggested commerce people are always transactional so i'll present the ministry of not in the ministry of commerce and industry view but i'll present my view on how i see uh, the internationalization of higher education and how india can become a global hub so what is the state of play so when we when we get into any discussion on commerce we always ask what is the state of play presently so the state of play presently is that there are large number of students from india who are going abroad there are large number of students who are internationally going around uh, we understand there is a number of around 5 million students more than 5 million students worldwide they are studying in countries other than their country so basically they are going abroad and they are taking education abroad so it's around more than 5 million out of that around 1 million is indian students so out of 5 million 1 million are indian students and the number of students who are coming to india is around 50000 so you can see the the imbalance which is there in terms of how many students are coming into india and how many students are going abroad 
So that is one, one thing I just wanted to put in perspective. The second important thing which is very very important for India is that the demand for higher education is growing very very rapidly and this demand is going to grow at a very high rate in years to come. Our present gross enrollment ratio in higher education is around 26% and the target of our new education policy is to take it up to 50%. So considering our population, considering the young people who will enter into this higher education uh, age group, so the demand for higher education domestically will also rise very very significantly. So on one side we have a huge Indian students who are going abroad, huge number of students of other countries who can be given education in India and at the same time we have a situation in which demand for higher education will increase in India. So it's a, I would say it's a big big opportunity for our education service providers. And sir mentioned about we have public sector, we have private sector in the higher education space. And one of the important change which he pointed out, large increase in number of seats, especially in public institutions has happened. The other day I was in my college, in, in our time the number of seats which were there, now the number of seats has become 10x. So the number of seats are increasing, new campuses are getting opened up, IITs, IIMs in places which we never imagined. So we are getting uh, good colleges. So I think there is a need for uh, more such colleges, more institutions in the public space to quarter, cater to this demand for higher education. And one important trend which I would like to mention, which, which is the online education, the digital mode of delivery of service. So the pandemic has accelerated the implementation, the adoption and the acceptability of online education as a mode of delivery of service and we have seen that a uh, lot of regulations got matured during this time and a lot of uh, courses which which were never thought could be delivered through online mode have started getting delivered through online mode. So I think that is another development which one needs to keep track of. That is an important trend which is expected to continue. The second important uh, opportunity which I would suggest here is the way work is changing. The nature of work which we all engage in, the education requirement of individuals will undergo a lot of change because working environment is becoming very very dynamic. So education institutions which can come out with courses which are very relevant to the context, which are dynamic, which are which enhance the employability of students after they do that particular course. I think they will stay ahead of the curve. So these are the two trends which I would like to mention, the digitalization and the, and the nature of work, the dynamic nature of work which will determine the, the education courses. So what are the opportunities for our education service providers? So one is, I mentioned scaling up is very, very important. Scaling up on online mode, I think that would require lesser investment. Offline mode scaling up would require more investment in physical infrastructure, but I think digital infrastructure scaling up can be done faster. And I think uh, that is one, one way one can uh, really try and get into number of other courses also, which are not the full-fledged full courses, but uh, short-term courses. Important opportunity for us in the area of policy making and uh, uh, Pavan sir mentioned about uh, the gift city regulations which have come out very recently. I think uh, they, they, are the, they are the, I would say the trend setter I think for the policies to come in times to come and uh, uh, I think having more foreign universities, the top foreign universities establish their campus in India will provide opportunity to Indian students to study in these universities in India itself. Another thing which, which is an opportunity for our top universities to go abroad and set campuses in other countries. Now 
these are the opportunities which which are available for our service providers and from the side of department of commerce we are trying three four things in all our engagements so you are aware we enter into trade agreements with many countries so what we are trying to secure in these trade agreements for our education service providers we are trying to get the market access we are trying to get uh, uh, a most favored nation kind of a treatment for them locked in so that when they want to set up their campus in these countries when they want to supply education services through online mode they don't face any problem they don't face any restriction so that is something which we are doing we have done it in case of australia we had a recent uh, fta with australia so in that we have been able to get the best terms of treatment for our service providers the second very important thing which will help in uh, in india uh, becoming an attractive destination is mutual recognition of qualifications so our qualifications educational qualifications getting recognized in the other country and other countries qualifications getting recognized in our country so that was done in case of uk very recently with uk we signed an agreement in which they now recognize our qualifications and we recognize theirs and we are doing that for australia also the negotiation are going on so that is another approach which department of commerce is trying the third thing which we are uh, again uh, focusing on is post study work visa requirement for our students so our students who are studying in foreign countries they are able to work for some time and uh, they are able to acquire professional experience in these countries so these are some of the interventions some of the initiatives which we are taking i think i'll wrap it up here and be i'll be happy to take questions and interact with you thank you thank you uh, mr darpan jain and uh you very well uh, you know told us about your role from the ministry of commerce uh, i think he brought up a very important point on uh, edtech and online uh, degree programs uh, and i think we'll take this up as a question from the audience uh, if anybody doesn't want to ask i would definitely like to but uh, a little later uh, may i now invite another policy uh, person uh, mr prem from niti ayog who handles education portfolio there and uh, let us listen to his views uh a very good afternoon to all of you uh in the midst of uh, these experts in sec education sector especially in higher education sector uh, i'll focus primarily on public policy and as my colleague darpan has gone very transactional uh, i'll move to the conceptual level or the philosophical level at this uh the as far as the, the 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 topic or theme of developing india as a global higher education hub is concerned it has been discussed in many forums where i or amitabh kant or our vc have taken part and uh, you know many a times we have come up with this uh, issues of discussion as far as data is concerned that's in public domain and uh, you know uh, the previous speakers have given the data of what kind of inflow and outflow we have in the education sector uh, if we get into the causes of why this skewed kind of you know uh, number of students going out of india and coming into india uh, there are many causes i mean uh, 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 secretary from external affairs the previous speakers they have talked about it uh, i'll focus primarily on the factors which are caused by the government i mean in that sense quote and quote i would say that you know we make policies in good intention but there are trade offs and sometimes the policy that government makes you know has some posit positives here and, and some some negatives on the other side and these negatives in that sense they become you know regulatory obstructions for a good vibrant higher education sector and this was very well appreciated uh by by the by the current government in uh, 2015 16 itself and they had set up a committee under the previous vice chairman uh, professor panagadia uh, on you know how do we deregulate higher education sector and this committee came up with recommendations and large number of recommendations which were eminently doable were undertaken by ugc 
uh, and there is there has been some amount of freeing of higher education sector in that sense but there is lots to be done and and then the national education policy came up there again we emphasize that you know a lot of things need to be done uh, and, and some steps have been taken uh, in terms of joint degrees uh, you know financial academic and regulatory autonomy of higher education institutions kind of uh, you know autonomy in getting faculty members uh, and so on and so forth uh, but as i said that even now we have a lot lot of steps to be taken from the government side and especially niti ayog we are conscious of it we keep you know discussing internally within the government with ministry of education and other stakeholders of how it needs to be done also we need to know that whenever we are talking about the you know students from outside countries coming into into india it is not only the higher education institutions or ministry of education which is a stakeholder then ministry of external affairs you know uh, ministry of home affairs and state governments and so on and so forth then the complexity increases and and in government you know it's a, it's a very clear message that when there are multiple ministries involved that particular tasks will become that much more difficult i mean even even with one ministry is difficult and in niti ayog we have been trying to coordinate with various ministries how we can make things easier for students who want to come into india you know discussion with mha mea state governments ministry of education uh, individual universities and so on and so forth and and as i said that this this journey will continue also ministry of education came up with various schemes like study in india spark gyan you know these initiatives are in bits and pieces in peace mill manner but they are steps in right direction and and we from our side are you know well cognizant of this fact that this is not enough and we need to do more uh, now few of the things that currently niti ayog feels that you know uh, these are some of the areas if we if we take steps in these areas we can we can improve you know our uh, position as far as uh, you know uh, global hub of education is concerned uh, first is understanding our comparative advantage let's be very clear that no student will come to india if we don't have a comparative advantage in that and and we have comparative advantages secretary external affairs said that there are large areas where india is in any case have i mean indian education system or indian higher education system has comparative advantage and lots of students from all across the world would like to come in okay and that needs to be studied in depth and then uh, pushed in right direction the second is about you know having a vibrant research and innovation ecosystem in higher education so this is another area where ministry of education you know ministry of science and technology uh, under uh, national education policy now we have you know uh, national uh, innovation foundation in line with the, you know research foundation of us and so on and so forth many things are coming in there is another area which all of us need to look into that in indian higher education system there are lots of things which can be done but we are not able to you know segregate absence of evidence from evidence of absence you know there are many things in india which are very very good let's say you know during covid time they used to say if you have some particular kada uh, it 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 it's supposed to be good but many of us i mean i am a medical doctor from ams okay let me tell you so we used to say no this is wrong okay and there is one side which is pushing that this is right the right answer should be that i don't know prove it that it is good then i'll start consuming prove it in a double blind rigorous trial that this particular initiative is helpful you know then we should consume but in india we don't have that kind of nuanced response we will have one section of society saying ye sab bakwas hai this is not right the other side blindly follows it so i think in in india we have huge chunk of wisdom knowledge you know wealth medical uh, you know uh, repository which suffers from this 
uh, if you go to west they can immediately do a rigorous scientific study and and bring up a molecule then it is marketed and so on and so forth but in india we are not able to do this and let me tell you at highest level also they have understood this subtle difference between absence of evidence as as being construed as evidence of absence so this i think is one area which the entire higher education system needs to crack it the last but not the least you know we can have this data we can have this anecdotal you know uh, examples and so on and so forth but if we want to go to the outside world we need to have a very beautiful story you know generally it's 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 said that you know this universe is made up of atoms but this world is made up of stories we need to create stories where we can tell the outside world that in india the higher education system or the indian education system is very very good all of us sitting in this room we know that if you see the top you know 20 companies in this world you know 10 or 12 ceos will be indians not only indians they would have been educated in india in terms of their school education primary education or even graduates national science foundation the chairperson in usa is from iit uh, bombay iit mumbai okay all of us know this but it just you know which is away because we have not created a powerful story out you know on this and i i think uh, you know our previous ceo amitab khan sir is going to attend this seminar i feel that all of us sitting you know we need to create those stories we need to create narratives you know having data having lots of facts having you know uh, many uh, anecdotal illustrations may not be enough to make india a, you know global higher education hub we need stories and we have enough data enough facts enough evidence to create these powerful stories uh, thank you very much uh, and i am extremely happy to be here amidst you and i'll be happy to answer the questions thank you thank you uh, thank you very much sir and i think one point that came out uh, you know from your talk was that we certainly need to have an interministerial approach and we've tried to do this uh, when uh, mr rajiv kumar was the vice chairman and uh, mr amitabh kant was the ceo of niti ayog when we brought in uh, you know the ministry of education home affairs ministry of commerce uh, you know and of course mea uh, together to discuss how we each one of them can really play a major role in attracting foreign students uh, so our next speaker is mr abhay sena uh, he is the director general of uh, the services export promotion council which is under ministry of commerce uh, i work closely with him being a governing board member on scpc and education is one of the champion services and abhay you could share what we do at scpc uh, so that many more will uh, also know uh, and like fiki you know we are trying to be very aggressive there and fortunately we have people like mr darpan jain who have always guided us and helped us to do so thank you ma'am and uh, thank you all the previous Not speakers more than 6 minutes yeah i think i'll finish within that time and thank you sir for uh, giving such a great insight uh, into this particular issue of internationalization of higher education and uh, as mentioned there are building blocks jigsaw puzzle there has to be an integrated approach and everything should be brought together and uh, some of the points which came out there's nothing new i believe just a reflection on that one was market access and i must mention services export promotion council is a set up under ministry of commerce looked after by darpan jain sir and dr vidya is our chairperson on education so we are playing a kind of catalytic role in promoting higher education market access information on global markets fta as so mentioned those are the aspect that we need to work and that will provide a lot of ideas where to promote the higher education you know we can segment uh, the entire region into our uh, potential areas and accordingly uh, the promotion can be done brand promotion has been mentioned telling the stories now it will require a collective approach institutions are definitely doing it on their own but a collective effort is required under the umbrella of ministry of commerce or ministry of education 
there are certain uh, models which are existing like the way it has been done in case of pharma even in case of entertainment sector audio visual gaming it has been done like as a content hub of the world the uh, the companies have united the come under one umbrella and launch those campaign we can do that in education sector there was a mention of relevance of the education and that is what is uh, required if we have to attract students from coming abroad to india is that education the course what we are providing is relevant to them not only in you know uh, providing them higher education or degree but in terms of employability so that aspect we need to uh, uh, you know uh, address mra as mentioned that is a welcome step and uh, one was mentioned about the post study work visa i believe the reverse way will also be required so these are the aspects and uh, associate with scpc i would request all the institutions because we are a platform uh, you know for you to take up the issues and the challenges and of course the market issues market access related all efforts with the minister of commerce and related ministry thank you thank you uh, thank you abhay ji for such a nice uh, short and crisp uh, you know presentation and i would really request all the academic institutions here to become members of scpc because this is one platform that will help us to promote uh, you know our university education abroad uh, and they do it very well uh, the next speaker is uh, mr manoj kumar uh, i think we've all heard so many times through the day about the study in india program and he spearheads the whole study in india initiative i think it's a wonderful initiative Uh, by the ministry of education since 2018 uh, we worked very very closely with him and his uh, team uh, i'm sure he will be uh, able to give us more information and again here i would request all the educational institutions present here uh, to keenly look at what study in india has been doing and how you all can be a part of this initiative thank you dr vidya ji good afternoon as we have throughout the con today's session we have felt the need of the study in india uh, all of us have found the gap between what the inbound students is there and uh, we say nearly inbound student what darpan ji has told or in the uh, morning session also it will be nearly 50000 and outbound student from the country is nearly 8 lakh students so the need at various level from the government side everywhere we have felt that yes there is a the need to bridge this gap now we have a strong network of nearly 1000 universities 40000 colleges many of this in the government side as well as the private side are really world class we have seen in the last 40 50 years iccr has done a remarkable job in uh, what uh, secretary is has told that nearly 2 lakh 50000 students must have studied in various scheme but we are not having a complete data of alumni and all those things which can which can be captured and then they can be brand and mr for us to carry this uh, study in india scheme forward another effort from the various universities maybe uh, symbiosis uh, many other universities at their own made wonderful efforts in bringing the foreign students into india in line with the same efforts in four years back in april 2018 uh, madam sushma swaraj ji late madam sushma swaraj ji launched this study in india scheme uh, with the concern, with the common efforts from ministry of education and ministry of external affairs so uh, what is the peculiar about this this is in line with the already taken actions in study in india in this number one is there is no difference between the government institutions and private institutions what is the criteria we have maintained a quality in this study in india scheme from government side ini institute of national importance iits nits iims triple its they are participating and then from private side uh, we have kept uh, this nirf and nec ranking which is the established ranking in the country nira nirf top 100 and nec 3.26 and above and for the last 3 and 1/2 years we have experienced that wonderful uh, this private institutions qualifying this criteria are participating wonderfully in the 
last three years. As of now, we are having nearly 235 MOUs with the government and private institutions. More than 50% are private institutions from this. Yes, we have felt this. This is the one of the this is one of the required efforts in the right direction. But yes, a lot much has to be done from all the uh, stakeholders. What Ministry of Commerce from Darpanji has told, uh, we are also implementing one of the scheme. This is Champion Services schemes. Due to COVID, uh, there was some some lagging in the last two three years. Like it may be city tours, it may be uh, this uh, English bridge course is also there. So these two three steps are being taken from this year. So I hope we started uh, with a humble start of 760, 780 students in the first year. Last year, through scholarship, we are having 1800, 2000 scholarships. But what is the peculiar in this thing that in our effort to attract the foreign students, not only 700, 1700, 1800 students through scholarships came, but the drive and the information in the, in the disseminations of different private institutions, government institutions throughout the world attracted nearly 2,000, 3,000 self-financing students also. I think that is our major goal. These scholarships are just a short-term goal to attract the attention of the foreign students. The, but the final goal is this, that the students, based on the quality of our institutions in the country, shall themselves think of coming to India at their own. That is the, our criteria. That will attract the uh, major, that is the major diplomacy of the, that is major requirement for the country. I I think effort is on that direction from all the ends and uh, what I think that uh, yes uh, in the previous we have st to seen that what is study in st Australia they have made some uh, efforts in for firstly scholarships and then so many things a study in India New Zealand we are going in line with that and I hope with the co common efforts from all sides whether in the go go policy making side or the private institution sides we are having yes a complete togetherness is coming up and surely we will bridge this gap in coming years. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Manojji. I think uh, as universities, many of us have been beneficiaries of the study in India and to drive India as an education destination, study in India will play a major role in years to come. I'm sure the number of countries and the efforts that they take right now will certainly manifold uh, and a lot of new policies have come up. I'm sure Mr. Manoj Kumar will elaborate uh, you know, uh, with each one of you individually. Uh, our last speaker for the day is uh, Professor uh, Sanjeev Chaturvedi. I think he uh, wears a very different hat. He's just returned to uh, India from Uzbekistan and he established uh, a very uh, wonderful center on behalf of the government of India, a center for entrepreneurship development. Uh, as you may be aware that there are a large number of, of students who come from the CIS region and more specifically Uzbekistan. So we requested him to share his experiences of his interactions with, uh, with students from Uzbekistan as well as uh, he also says that, you know, Uzbekistan Sun is very open to establishment of Indian university campuses and some of the Indian universities have already established campuses in that country. So over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vidya. Uh, first of all, my apology uh, and my, uh, my colleague Abhay's apology for catching like a local uh, bus here and we were in the other hall and we realized that nobody is there then we got a phone call where are you everybody is here so our apologies second when madam was in uh, introducing me i took and took the dais because i thought uh, it will give me another 10 15 seconds more uh, while walking from there I have only three, four points and it is very practical. Let me first uh, introduce what we did in the last two years at Uzbekistan. Not uh, much is known about Uzbekistan and Central Asia because less information is exchanged except uh, at the ministerial level. Uh, these are five countries which are earlier part of Soviet uh, Union and uh, in 1991, they, they started their own education policy and in particular Uzbekistan, there is a lot of attraction for the universities and to bring students from Uzbekistan and Central Asia to your institutions here. So when they got the independence from Soviet Union, 
they switched the entire education from Russian to their local language. In Uzbekistan, they switched to uh, Uzbek language. But now they realized in the last five, six years that without English, they cannot survive. So you will find every street in Tashkent having a English language coaching institute. And when I say every street, it means every street. Because what happens is that if you want to get admission in uh, any private institutions or private university, you have to pass ILTS. So all the institutions are giving, and they are very expensive, 200 to 300 dollar, which is a very expensive for a student. Now the second important thing is, so the first is English language anybody wants to teach in Uzbekistan or any Central Asian uh, countries, you will be having no problem of students paying 200 to 300 dollar for a two months course. Second, what Uzbek government has done is that any girl student who score five in out of uh, nine or yeah out of nine in IELTS exam get the entire fees back. So a lot of girl students are now taking up the uh, PG and UG courses, and they are uh, quite good student. Now, as Dr. Vidya said, what they are offering to institutions like you, they give you free land, the government of Uzbekistan, they give you free building to start the campus. There are three universities from India which are right now functioning in Uzbekistan. And one is in Tashkent, one is in Nandijan, and of course one is in uh, um, uh, one more city. So, anyone who wants to enter Central Asia, this is the right time. And Tashkan is already filled with more than 20 universities now. These are from Korea, from Turkey, from British, uh, uh, from um, um, uh, India, of course, and uh, lastly, uh, very recently, um, some Russian universities also. Now, what courses? Of course, medical, we all know, but IT, we can have actual uh, students rushing for, if you have 100 seats, there will be 1,000 students coming for IT courses from India, because they know that we are good in IT. Second, service industry. All, uh, Madam also mentioned about the service industry, and Abhay is already here. So service industry is very picking up very fast, and that too in English. And lastly is the med medical, of course, not uh, the hospital side, but the dental, nursing, physiotherapy, etc. If anybody is running these courses, they can start this. Uh, you get the building, you start the uh, course in next four months, and you will be filled with students. So these are the opportunities which are there in in the Uzbekistan and Central Asia, and uh, I will be very happy. I will been uh, talking to Dr. Vidya for uh, about six, seven months that how we can take a delegation of education from here to Uzbekistan uh, and other Central Asian countries and lot of opportunities are there and lastly many students want to come to India. We are talking about being the Vishwa Guru. I think this is the time when we ca can call all the Central Asian students for a short duration courses at your campuses, your universities here. So that is all uh, as an educationist, uh, I can give a feedback and I'm very open for any question answer later on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chaturvedi. I think we all uh, were not so much aware of this region as much as we were aware of the West Asia, Gulf, and of course, uh, Africa. So thank you so much, and I'm sure you'll have a lot of questions. So we have just 1 minute and 49 or 48 seconds, now 47 seconds. Any questions to the panelists? Yeah, I hope that's a question and not a suggestion or a recommendation. Yes, please. You can uh, you can ask the question and direct it to any specific person here. Yeah, uh, my name is Priya. Um, I have a question for any policy maker that deals with... We can't with hear you. Uh, Ms. Priya, can you also tell us where you come from? Uh, I'm from Project Guru. We represent the industry. So I'm basically from the industry side. Uh, the so I have only one question for... 
can uh, the voice is not clear i have only one question for the policy makers uh, the team panel here uh, there is an issue which has not been talked about and that is of reservations uh, uh, the report was shared with us uh, of ey um, organization where it was mentioned that 50% of college seats are reserved for the uh you know the backward class so if we are inviting uh, students from abroad and we want them to um, get enrolled in our universities then whose seats or what percentage of the resources or what percentage of the seats and whose seats are they taking up how are the resources getting distributed there because there are uh, capable people who might not be able to you know uh, get a seat instead of them so how is this being addressed so, yeah so maybe i can answer your question on behalf of all the policy makers because uh, you know i can say it with uh, confidence that these are super numerous seats so they don't eat up seats of indian students at all right so uh, it's 15% and for some category 1 institutions it moves up to even 20% and now they're talking about 40% so it doesn't really hamper the education of indian students okay parisans <laughs> Anybody and with talk? your permission maybe we can take this last Why? question from sir myself professor vijay khare from savitri bai phule pune university uh, from last uh, one decade i am handling international center and i have hosted large number of student uh, around 12500 student from 107 countries and uh, we have generated around 52 crore revenue also from administrative charges and all but my experience let me share being the policy we, we need to introspect ourselves recently government of india come out with the 25% uh, over and above supplementary quota uh, when i look at the 12500 student uh, most of them are 24% from nepal and rest of the you know sudan africa and uh, other countries when we are talking about the quality education and vishwa guru we need to relook and revisit for collaboration unless and until we have a sustainable collaboration with the uh, western university particularly in research and developing ecosystem that will not helpful because most of the time most of the universities looking towards internationalization for the earning the money i am not blaming to anyone but the kind of efforts the quality when we call it the phd and the master program uh, let me share few things uh, most of the african student they are attracting and getting very minimal charges particularly in the field of scientific hardly i we are actively involved with the european union as well as the uh, so, is there European a question to question is that so how we could uh, make it the another one kind of plan where we can attract the uh, western university to get a degree in the field of scientific area that is my question because we need to update our universities for that uh, you need to give us such kind of uh, additional uh, financial help to the universities where they can attract the western university to get a uh, uh, scientific degrees in indian universities thank you sir public university so anyone yeah uh, i'd like to share one or two live example with you in tashkan itself there are two universities which are one from uk and one from singapore and what they do is that when they tie up with any institution in fact the central asia is more backward than indian universities i would say in in academic uh, uh, standards uh, they basically focus on two things that the teaching and the examination are totally different i i know a french consortium which has 20 french universities which are interested in india but they have only two major problems one that the entire course structure will come from there for a particular semester and secondly the examination and the copies will be checked by their people not by the local partner it can be india it can be singapore any other countries so if you are looking for collaboration with the western countries universities we have to be very very impartial in the way we teach here what we do the same uh, professor set up the question paper and also examine the question answer sheets also 
So you cannot be the vakil, you cannot be the petitioner, you can't be the judge yourself. So there are different models which are working in this. So I think that will help you. So Sauvik wants to respond to this. Yeah, uh, with due respect, uh, uh, Dr. Chaturvedi, the, the practice you just described that uh, professors should, you know, the vakil and other things, all over the Europe, that's probably the best model in the world today. Uh, I think best universities in India, they are following the same model. But if the French, they want to be different, that's fine. But that necessarily is not a better model in my humble opinion. I, I, I fully agree with you, yes. I have another opinion on the previous uh, uh, lady's question. Whenever you segregate seats, I think in an absolute sense, you are going to deprive probably a more competent individual. But you are doing it for a purpose. Whether you are uh, reserving seats for a gender, or for a community, or for overseas students, you are doing it for a purpose. So, but yes, even if it's supernumerary, you could have thrown open those seats to more competent people from your domestic market. It's always true for every institute. Yes. So I think we'll end this session here with one last uh, comment from each one of you for just just one comment from each one of them. How can you make this, uh, make India as an education hub in one sentence or one word? One word probably will be too sm uh, short, but one sentence. Creating awareness about uh, uh, the strength of Indian education system and integrating with the brand promotion. Okay, so creating awareness. I feel the system is already being developed. As of now, we have the like 24/7 call center. 24 into 7 call center is there, where any student can call in on that uh, toll-free number, and he will be replied. He will be called back within. Uh, very so a quick time. response to the query. Response is one of the things we also. I think uh, we need to work on a focused action plan. All of us need to partner and do that. Very good. A focused action plan. Institute a flagship fellowship program to build India's brand of higher education and uh, take this opportunity of G20 to do so. Excellent. So build uh, a brand for education in India and against the backdrop of G20. I can talk about Central Asia. Visit Central Asia, see the opportunity already there. So it's the best practice. Okay, so here is one person who promotes Central Asia for all of you. Anyway, thank you very much, panelists. It's been a wonderful discussion, and I'm sure there was a lot of takeaway from this discussion, and we hope that we see a large number of students, and it's not just about student mobility, but program mobility, you know, ed tech and online, and also, of course, uh, the foreign university campuses. So we end here, and once again, I thank the August panel. Thank you very much indeed, ma'am. Ladies and gentlemen, let's put our hands together for our eminent panelists for those wonderful discussions we had from them and we quickly have a group photograph we've done thank you so much and I would request everybody to kindly remain seated as we are straight away moving into our next session the topic for which is universities the hub of knowledge and tech innovation Kindly remain seated, give us few minutes while we arrange the top table for the next session.